Amen, amen, amen. Can we welcome our campuses? Let's say hi to Plant City and South Shore. What's up, you guys? How are you? Love you, delighted to be with you. Uh, I wanna start with a little humor today, all right? So there's a plane going down over the desert with only three parachutes on board. There are four people on board the plane, the smartest man in the world, the best doctor in the world, an old priest, and a young photographer. The doctor says, people need me for my medical skills. He grabs the first parachute and he jumps. The smartest man in the world says, people need me for my intelligence. He grabs a pack and he jumps. The old priest says, I've lived a long and happy life. You take the last shoot. To which the young photographer says, don't worry, there are enough shoots for the both of us. The smartest man in the world just grabbed my backpack. <laughs> so sometimes we think we're reaching for the right thing and it just doesn't get us where we wanna go, amen? amen? Amen, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for today. We pray that you would do something supernatural inside of us. Teach us, show us, guide us, transform us. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen and amen and amen. So we're in a new series called Open Hand. We've been talking about God accessing our hearts to move through our hands. We're talking about generosity. We've been talking about the tithe. That's our first tenth portion, okay, to enjoy God's blessing and his abundance. So we've been talking about that for a couple of weeks here. We're just kind of layering it in. You don't wanna miss next week, all right? You, you really don't. Because anytime we talk about finance resource, we always wanna address the fact that some people are struggling and we really do wanna help. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. amen. So, so, so listen, uh, the big one is always dead. It's always, always, always dead. And so we wanna address that next week. We wanna get you help. We wanna talk about going beyond the tithe, all right? So we wanna talk about the next steps, the, the, the larger things. And then I wanna talk about some vision items next week and ask you to join us in prayer. And we are not pledging, we're not driving, I'm not asking for resource, okay? I just, I wanna show you some things and ask you to pray with us. There's some great things on the horizon for the church and I would love for you to join, all right? So I ran across a book that I wanna to recommend to you. You're gonna see it on the screen, God and Money, Cortines and Bomber. And there are two young men, who, very, very bright men, young men, who went to Harvard. This is a 2014 book, so it's been just a little bit here. And uh, I'm gonna be referring to it today some as we move forward. They were collaborating on a term project, talking about charitable giving and generosity and so on. And they, they kind of stumbled into their words. They stumbled into this amazing arena, and it really changed their lives. Here is how they started. At the start of our time at Harvard Business School, not too shabby, all right, we each had plans to buy multi-million dollar homes, accumulate fortunes for ourselves, not necessarily the right pack, right, church? Anybody? Bueller? Not necessarily the right pack. We think we're going for the right pack, and yes, perhaps give to our churches and sometimes charities along the way. John's online banking password was retire at 40. Now, however, it's pretty remarkable. Now, however, post all of this sort of instruction and then revelation that happened in the heart, uh, our goal is to give away all, everybody say all. all. All of our financial earnings beyond certain thresholds that we have prayerfully established. So they've gone beyond, and we're talking about first 10% the tithe. They've gone way, 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 way. They're talking about radical Christianity and living, uh, really from the heart. So in our culture, there's fame and wealth uh, uh, acquisition is the word that I was trying to get out, and self-promotion, isn't there? But there's also this incredible change that's taking place culturally, especially in young professionals that are saying something like this, I don't want all the pomp and circumstance. Whatever said on Twitter, said on Twitter, I want more worship. Come on, can I get an Amen. I want more prayer, I want more authenticity, I want more of the things of God, I want more of the old things of God, and I, and want to say this with me, I am gonna give my whole self to the Lord. So that's the young, that's the generation that's coming up that everybody's like, oh, the Lord. So they're coming for us, church, they're coming, they're coming. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says this, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all of your ways. Acknowledge him, 
and he'll direct your path. Trust him, trust him. And then the verse goes on and says to honor him with the first of the first portion of your wealth and he'll fill your barns and overflow your vats. That means bank accounts and so on here, all right? The promise is right there. So years ago, 11, 12 years ago, when I talked about the tithe, I would bring my son out, he's 17, so he was five, six at the time, and I would put a full-size ladder on stage, like a full-size, big, big ladder. And I would have him climb up on the ladder, and then I would say, come on, jump, jump to me, all right? And uh, it was very dramatic. I had to stop doing the illustration because the seasoned saints in the house would not have it any longer. <laughs> They were just, I had people come up to me and just say, look, I can't take it. My heart can't take it. He's, he's on top of the ladder. He's five, he's six. And, and the little guy, man, he, do you understand that God is asking us for faith like a child? So he would stand on this six foot ladder and he would just squat. I mean, everything he had, he would just squat and just leap. And of course, dad was there to catch him. Um, at one time he jumped and he jumped so hard, he almost knocked the ladder over. And that's the time that I had people like, oh no, you'll never do that again, pastor. You, you, you're done. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I get it. The point is this, it takes real courage to let go of where we are to go to where God's calling us to be. It takes real, I mean, it takes guts, it takes real courage and have trust that you're not leaping to nothing, you're leaping to someone. Come on, can I get an amen? You're literally leaping to the open arms of your heavenly father. So when we talk about the tithe, every single one of us, and I believe this, I truly believe this in my heart, I really do. Every person that's listening to the message right now wants to be generous, I believe that. Come on, can I get an amen, church? Seriously, seriously. Every person wants to be generous, they wanna be gracious, they wanna help, they wanna serve, they wanna open their hearts to the Lord. There's this thing though, there's this belief that we just don't feel like we can. We can't make the two ends meet. There's too much month for our money, right? We just can't get it done. And so we're saying, there's just, I would love to, there's just no possibility to do that. And that is called a scarcity mentality. It's a, it's a mind, heart, mind, will, and emotion. It's a scarcity mentality, okay? And what God wants for us is something that's uh, much greater, expansive. So here's what I wanna do, all right? Uh, I want you to take your hands and, and just humor me a couple times today, all right? Take your hands like this, and I want you to just squeeze, all right? Begin to squeeze, and I want you to hold it for a while. Don't squeeze and let go. Hold it, and I want you to squeeze this as hard as you can. Don't rupture anything, okay? In the name of Jesus. Don't squeeze, 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 squeeze. You can feel the blood leaving your hands. It's being redirected, okay? This is what stress feels like. This is what pressure feels like. Come on, are you still with me? Hang in there. This is, this is what scarcity feels like. All right, now on the count of three, I'm gonna count to three and I want you to just open your hands nice and slow. One, two, three. Take a deep breath with me. Okay. All right, that's what fullness feels like. That's what flow feels like, open-handedness. You feel the blood coming back into your hands? You feel it? And so this is what open, this is what freedom feels like. This is what grace, come on somebody, smile with me. This is what grace feels like. Open-handedness is the opposite of scarcity mentality. It, it, it's the opposite, all right? It's abundance. Everybody say abundance. It's abundance. But we have to trust in order to open our hands because we're always positioning, thinking something's gonna be taken from us. I want you to know God's not trying to take something from you. He's trying to get something to you. Amen? Amen. He's trying to get something to you. Some of you are still, I see in the congregation, you're still going like this. <laughs> all right, let grace arrive. So we don't have the same worries. All of us don't have the same worries, but all of us feel like resourcing and finance and job are, are number one. They're the first thing. They're the first stressors. So they're the things that cause us to just, man, when, and our health and the health of our children, so on and so forth. Amen, you got it. So we just, it gets so difficult to have an open hand and have grace and freedom. So when I first started tithing, when me and Tamara first started tithing, it was over 30 years ago, I would pray something like this. I'm pretty certain this is gonna fail. <laughs> you guys with me? Yeah. Like I'm, I, I, I was just starting out. I'm pretty certain this is gonna fail and I'm gonna feel like a fool or I'm gonna make a fool of myself. Can anybody identify? I feel like I'm being tricked somehow. This, this is weirdness to me. 
I came to the Lord late in life. I mean, I came to the Lord in college. I was a junior in college. And everything that I heard about the church was there after your, come on, say it again. Okay. And so the whole, like we get it, we understand. So everything, I mean, and, and I would say to the Lord, something like this, brand new praying, I'd say, you know we can't do this. You ever had those conversations with the Lord? Like, you know everything, and you know what's in the checking account, you know what's, and so the very first time we tithed, we actually were really in a tough spot. We had $12, we tithed, you know, $1.20. And, and if you tithe less than that for your first time, come tell me, and we'll humble ourselves together, okay? In the name of Jesus, the first tithe, $1.20. And somehow, at the end of that month, we had $120 exactly, more than all of our bills. Somehow. Can I get an amen for that? Come on, you guys. Okay, so 30 years, 30 years, God is faithful all the time, every time, and I just wanna hear from you Christians, isn't he? Isn't he? God is faithful every time, all the time. I wanna say this, it's not always the way we think it is. And it's always, and, but it's always right there in that hour when we need it the most. God is very, very creative. I talked about that last week. You can go and look at that. So all of us need safety and security. We all need safety. We all need security. We're all designed for it. But the Bible warns us of misguided dependence, just dependence on things that are not him. We're going for what we think is gonna be the parachute. It's just the wrong thing. It's the wrong thing. So we wanna provide for our families, everybody does. All right, scripture in 1 Timothy 5, 8 says that. Uh, by the way, on the app, you can get all the notes. And I know I'm cruising, okay? We wanna ensure safety and support for our children. The Bible says that a wise man, a godly person, leaves inheritance for their children's children, all right? That is wisdom, it's awesome. We wanna save, we wanna earn, uh, standard living, all of those things. But the Bible also says in Proverbs 20, 21, Inheritance gained hastily leads to ruin. Listen to the stat. According to Money Magazine article, 70% of wealthy families, 70%, lose their wealth by the second generation. And 90% of them lose their wealth by the third generation. So the moral of the story is they need to work for what they get. Come on, can I get an amen? All the young people in the house, you guys are like, no, not amen. We're saying yes, amen. Because if you don't understand where it comes from, you can't appreciate it and honor God. You can't. It's just impossible to do when you think everything looks like this. And let me encourage you, please, to travel abroad. Travel to third world countries, and you'll just have a whole new understanding. All right. So we want to provide. We need safety and security. Everybody does. But we want to be careful. Say careful. careful. Mindful of misplacing, misguided devotion dependence, affection, all right? And those words are kind of describing love. They're describing love, mind, will, and emotion. Ascribing worship to something that is not God. Watch this, 1 Timothy 6.10. Say this with me, you'll see it on the screen, all right? And a lot of people mis, you know, misunderstand this verse. Here we go. For the love of money, can you see it on the screen? Is it there? Okay. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The Bible doesn't say that money is the root of evil. It's, the Bible is, is saying to us it's the root of all kinds, all kinds of evil, because it's so easy to fall into dependence. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, all right? So now we're talking about going beyond the material thing that we're talking about, and we're talking about worship. Everybody say worship. worship. Okay, so it's devo devotion is worship. Attention is worship. Ascribing um, a, a heart value is worship. It's worship that God's talking about. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and God and money, God and money. So money becomes mammon when money is bigger than God in your life, okay? So let me ask you this question. Let me just ask you this question, all right? How much money, I want you to come on, play with me here a little bit, come on, let's get in the game. All right, how much money, how much, think of a number, how much money would make you safe and secure and truly happy? I want you to think about it. Some of you are like, how much money is there? How much money? 
Because what we do is we earn, and then there's all this pressure from the outside looking back to us, and it says, if you had this, you would be happy. We have 5,000 ads a day that tell us how unhappy we are so that we'll buy the products that they're selling us. If you, just think about that for a second. Just, just think about that. We're, we're literally programmed. You need to be dissatisfied. You need to be dissatisfied. You need to be displeased. You need to be disappointed. You need to compare. You need to want. You need to move. You know, it's constant pressure coming to us, constant. So what, what, uh, what number, what number is out there? And there's some science behind this, but I, I just want you to think for a second. would make you totally safe for you like, man, I'm safe. I'm secure. I, I don't have to worry about anything. And I'm super happy. Come on, let's smile again. I'm super happy. Like I, I have this much and I'm happy. All right. Years ago, I personal trained um, and I trained in some really cool places down in South Florida. One was Turnberry Isle. It's very, it's kind of a ritzy whatever. Some of you know about Turnberry Isle. Raise your hand if you know about Turnberry Isle. Come on. Some of you in the house. I, I see you, Plant City, South Shore. I see you too. What's up? I see you. I really, okay. And the other one's called Fountain Blue. <clears throat> and so I trained, I used to train some wealthy clients. And I trained a guy named Saul. And um, I, I've told you, I probably shouldn't use his name. I, I trained a guy. <laughs> and uh, you know his name's Saul now, so there's no going back. <clears throat> and I have, I've, I've told you, he watched the stock market all the time. So training was just, you know, kind of the craft. It was, he's an older gentleman. He's in his 80s, so his mid-80s. And, and so he's always watching. He's watching, and uh, one day he says, <laughs> you know, he said, I made a half a million dollars a day. I, I said, wow. But another time, another time, we're watching, we're, he's looking at the TV, and he says something like this, and I'll try not to be too expressive. He's like, no, 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 no. And so we're in the middle of the session. I said, what's going on? He goes, so-and-so's trading to so-and-so, and so-and-so's trading to so-and-so. No, 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 no. And he went like this, and he grabbed his heart, and he goes, oh, and he just, he literally, he went pale white, and he collapsed on the floor. So we called 911, and uh, they came, and they said, There's, he's okay, there's nothing wrong with it. But I didn't see him for almost three weeks. And I was talking to a lady, <clears throat> and I, I said, man, I'm really concerned for Saul. She said, honey, don't be concerned for Saul. She said, Saul, Saul has more money than God, is what she said. You ever heard that statement? She said, there's wealthy people, then there's rich people, and then there's crazy, stupid rich people. He, she said, he's a $500 million guy. He has 500 million. Is that, I mean, that's a, good, a lot of money, $500 million. And she said, he loses millions and he gains millions like I lose weight on my tummy. She said, I look pretty good, don't I? I was like, I don't know, ask my wife. Um, <laughs> And so when I, <laughs> when I talked to Saul again, he told me, he said, blah, blah, blah. he said, I lost X amount of millions. He, he lost a couple of million dollars that day and he went into cardiac arrest. And I thought to myself, I was much younger and, and you know what I mean? I thought to myself, man, I feel sorry for him. And I really feel, so, so but we trick ourselves into thinking we're in an emergency situation and I need a parachute. I wanna tell you, your parachute's God. I, I wanna tell you, the thing that you're aiming for is God. There's not a number. Here's what the Bible says. Listen to me, Ecclesiastes 5.10 cautions this. He who loves money, it's just a misplaced dependency. That's all it is. And we can do it so easy. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. There's no amount of money that can make you safe. There's, let me say that again, because you guys are like, uh-uh, let me try it. Let me, let me try it. There's no amount of money. There is a God in heaven who can make you safe and make you secure. There's a God in heaven. I'm not talking about practical, everyday things. We've got to be wise. We've got to have judgment. We've got to be shrewd. We've got to earn. We've got to work. We've got to save. All, can I get an amen? amen? Okay, I'm talking about here. I'm ta I'm, all right? Because the love of money comes excessive worry and fear. The love, when, when there's worry and fear. We're always worrying about what's going on out there, okay? Money is a great servant, it is a terrible God. Money is a great servant, it's a terrible God. So God's okay with you having things as long as things don't have you. So if you have a bicycle, it's God's. 
If you have a car, it's God's. I've, I, kid, I was kidding around. I said, God didn't, you know, talking about the tithe. He didn't give you a Maserati. God doesn't care if you have a Maserati. If you have a Maserati, that's great. I want to ride in it. <laughs> I rode in, in a friend's car one time. It was a fancy as a BMW. And um, I, I didn't know cars did this, but it was very, very fast. Like a 450 or something. And it was a smaller car. And we went around a curve and he went around the curve really fast. And the seat grabbed me. I'm serious. It went, and it just pulled me back. I was like, yo. I said, is the rapture happening? I didn't know what was going on. God does not care if you have a house, does God have your house? If you have an airplane, does God have your air? He's not concerned with the things you have. He's concerned with the things that you have having you. So let me say this again. Anything that you own that God doesn't completely own still owns you. Can I say that one more time? Okay, because I'm, 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 I'm going, I'm New York speed today. Anything that you own that God doesn't completely own, that means anything, at any moment, God can say, I need you to do that with this. I need you to, you, we, we've got friends, we've just got friends who, they have stuff, but their stuff is just like this. I'm gonna use whatever this is for God. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. This is God's. Anything that you own that God doesn't completely own still owns you. So he's concerned about that thing. All right, so we want happiness. And sometimes I think about the word happiness. I'm like, oh, I don't want to say happy. But it's, it's a good word. God wants us to be happy, amen? Okay, I'm gonna read for a little bit um, some excerpts from the book, and I want you to just kind of stay with me, okay? Stay with me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, keep cruising. Giving for most people feels like it belongs in the second category of activities, something you do out of obligation. Everybody go, wah. Okay, you guys did great with that. That was awesome. And, you know, it's, it's kind of an obligation to help society get along or to help or to be a good person or whatever it is. We have an idea that it's a duty to give. Suck it up and kind of do our part. Okay, kind of. Unfortunately, there's no joy in the mindset. There's no joy in that mindset. And God says, I love a what? A cheerful giver. Why? Because it comes from right here. God doesn't care about zeros. He cares about this. He does. He really does, all right? Without the right heart, all we have is behavior modification. So listen to this, and, and, I, and I'm not trying to out anybody. If you're brand new or you've struggled giving or whatever, I'm not, this is not an indictment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the information. I hope, oh, can we just pray right now that'd be a heart change right now in the name of Jesus? Can we do that? Listen to me. Six out of seven Americans, American families, give less than 2% of their income. If the Christian church in America gave 10%, we could, do you ever sit back and think, man, look at the outside agendas that are going on in this world and how well-funded they are. You ever think that? Do you ever think just like, oh my gosh, so well-funded. If American Christians, all Christians gave 10%, we would be unstoppable. We would be absolutely unstoppable. There's, not, there's no force, speaking of a monetary resource, that we wouldn't have the ability to do. None. Z none. It would be staggering. I mean, it would blow your mind. Incredible. If giving isn't a structured part of your life, then it ends up being sort of like throwing up like a Hail Mary uh, sort of in the karma atmosphere. Everybody with me, right? It's like buying a cake uh, for a bake sale for kids or writing a $50 check for, uh, you know, peer pressure, something crazy. But if we truly understood that stinginess could kill us, as quickly and silently as smoking a pack a day. I mean, do you remember when smoking was cool, you guys? Do you remember? Media told us that smoking was cool, so we all smoked. And then somebody got a conscience, and media told us smoking was bad, so we stopped. Crazy. Crazy. Generosity is just as healthy and gives you as much of an energy rush as going for a daily jog. Let me give you some stuff. The actual science, like the science, when you read this book, God and Money, read it, I really recommend it, is staggering. Science of Generosity Project out of Notre Dame is where it comes from. In particular, the paradox of generosity for Christians by Smith and uh, Hillary Davidson, all right? So it's the resource. This is the weirdest thing you could ever encounter, okay? The more we have, the more we have as Americans, the more you get past like 150,000, 250,000, 300,000, 400,000, half a million, million, the more we have, this says, this sort of paradox, the more we have, the more we become like Gollum. Precious. Precious. You guys remember Gollum? 
This is what the study says. It says the more we have, the less we give. Because the more obsessed we are with what we have. And so when you read about the paradox, there's just this weird thing. It says that there's just, so watch this. There's more entitlement, right? Entitlement goes way up. Empathy, empathy means that you're able to stand in somebody else's shoes. Empathy goes way down and compassion goes way down. And in the study, the people that they studied, over 2,000 people in the study, they were even willing to steal from children. Come on, somebody, that's us. Sorry, not us. I didn't mean us. I didn't mean us, us. I just mean the other Americans. <laughs> so, when, when it's, so first of all, giving is good for you. Come on, amen. This is going to be the actual science, the science itself. So if you're new, okay, the science is good. It's really good for you. Intentional, regular practice of generosity have been associated with the release of a slew of good chemicals, oxytocin, dopamine, and various endorphins. Those chemicals are the same ones released after a hard workout. Can I get an amen? What's up? Or after a particularly pleasurable experience. I'll skip right over that one. Some of you are just getting it. We're in church. I love you. In fact, generosity is strongly and clearly associated with a sense of purpose in life, personal happiness, and overall personal health. Giving, as it turns out, lifts up the human health as much as heart medicine protect, protects the heart. Incredible. Incredible. Finally, giving activates the same portion of the brain that lights up when winning the lottery. <laughs> That's crazy. Or getting a raise. You may not be able to control getting a raise, but you can feel just as good simply by engaging in regular, consistent generosity. And then they named some philosophers, Immanuel Kant and Thomas Aquinas, theologians and philosophers. And when you read the book, especially if you're coming from kind of a, you're kind of like, ah, I'm a little skeptical, when you read what secular atheist and then theologians in history talk about the principles of giving, you can kind of lean in and say, you know what? I think God knows what he's talking about. Come on, can I get an amen, church? I think God knows he's... But sometimes we need secular data to prove our biblical belief. And God, but God is gracious. God knows the beginning from the end. He tells the truth, amen? He tells the truth. Conversely, a lack of giving is bad for you. Watch this. Those who, not, who do not regularly give, it's been found to har they harbor higher levels of the stress hormone called cortisol, which is linked to everything from headaches to stroke to depression, insomnia, all kinds of things at list. Living self-indulged and self-absorbed lives is literally killing us in the affluent West. It's killing us. As the author puts it, Americans who don't, don't give away 10% of their income run the significant risk of ending up less happy than they might have otherwise been. In fact, as a group, they're much, 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 much less happier. So here, here, let me round this out. Whatever is thought to be lost by Americans who give 10% of their income is offset by the greater likelihood of being happier in life. Come on, somebody, watch this. Rather than leaving generous people on the short end of an unequal bargain, practices of generosity are actually like likened to being generous givers, which provide things that are essential to life, like happiness. Come on, can I get an amen? amen. Happiness, like true happiness, health, and lasting purpose, which money and time simply cannot buy. So what we need is a gospel-centered revolution in our way of thinking. We need a change of heart. The only words, the only words that are in, not in all four of the gospels, they're in the book of Acts, but not in the gospels, Acts chapter 20, verse 35. And it says this, it's more blessed to give, come on, if you know the verse, it's more blessed to than it is to we used to joke around. I was, I was a college athlete, and we used to joke around and say, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than receive than we crash into each other. You know what I mean? It's just a misappropriation of the, of the resource. So here's what I wanna tell you, all right? We're wrapping it up. Giving brings happiness to the giver. Giving, let me say it again. Giving brings happiness to the giver. When my son was little, he's 17 now, he's a giant. When he was a little guy, like three years old, he had a little Snoopy fishing rod. And I would take him out to the little pond that was behind our house and we used to feed the fish. We would feed the, the small fish and then the bass would come eat the small fish and he has a little Snoopy rod. You remember Snoopy rod? And we would put bread, just a little bread ball on it. 
And these giant, I mean, over three years, these fish got giant. And I'll never forget taking him out there, putting a bread ball on. He cast it out, kind of go like this, and cast it out there. And his line just went. And his little Snoopy rod's about to explode. Is this a giant bass? And his little energy, he was just like, ha, 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 ha. He was so happy. So he's looking at me and he's holding the line. I'm thinking, it's gonna break any time. The bass goes all the way to the middle of the lake and then it stops and he reeled it in. Here's a picture of it. <clears throat> Would you check it out? Okay, so, so yeah, yeah. You guys are like, oh, you mean a big bass. <laughs> yeah, so here, here's what I wanna tell you. That motivation is, is like, it's like me giving. It's like us giving. It brings, when you give, come on somebody, can I get an amen? amen. When you give and you see the joy happening out here, it brings joy back to here. It literally, it literally brings joy and happiness to the inside of you. And so the motivation then is to go back to that place as human beings and to give and to give. And I wanna tell you, you can't outgive God. There's no way you can't outgive him. One day we were uh, out in the streets of Tampa and we were blessing people and praying for them. And uh, we, we found a, a man who was homeless. He didn't have a home. And uh, we said, we're gonna help you today. And we did a few things. And he literally broke out. He said, he said, hey, can I sing you guys a song? I said, I mean, I guess so. He said, can you record it? We said, yeah. And I don't have the recording. Man, we looked and looked and looked. He said, get your phone out. And he freestyled an entire song for the Crossing Church. He literally just went. I mean, I was like, this dude is crazy talented. And it affected me for an entire week. It affected me, the joy that raised up inside of me for a week and the tens of thousands of people that are ministered to at the Crossing and marriages and homes and children and the things that happen, give, come on, say giving, giving. makes the giver, makes the giver. Happy. happy. Amen. So these early decisions and experiences in our lives shape how we feel about giving and they're, they're often hard to get over. I was praying with a gentleman in our church and uh, he was an elder. He wasn't a formally an elder. He was, he was kind of that kind of guy. He was, he was a he was a necessary gentleman who had means, okay? And as I started talking to him about the tithe, he literally, church, he literally broke down in tears, shaking. He described an experience he had with his father where there was lack. There was just a, there was just a gap. It was missing. And I said to him, I said, um, would you like to get rid of that? Because all that's emotional trauma. I said, he said, yeah, I'd like to get rid of that. And we joined hands and we prayed, and he got rid of that stuff that was binding him up from his generation and his father and all the things that happened. His dad uh, worked and there were gaps and just all kinds of, there was all kinds of things there. And so uh, I, I wanna ask you the question today, do you wanna get free of some stuff? Amen? Amen. You wanna get free of some stuff? Amen. You wanna get free? There's just, just a freedom to get free of some of the things that kinda bind us up and clog us up this is generational, all right? Let me unpack this piece of scripture for us and we're gonna land. It's, generation, it's emotional and it's generational. Deuteronomy 5, seven through 10. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. All right, so if you go to places like India, the, it says that it's the land of 10,000 gods or the land of 1,000 gods. So you're gonna see, uh, the sun god, the moon god, all kinds of animals, and then men with symbols. You'll see all kinds of men, statues, women, and symbols as well. This is the land of a thousand gods. Okay, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This is super misunderstood, super misunderstood. Uh, a long time ago, I listened to Oprah Win Winfrey and she said, I stopped being a Christian because God said he was a jealous God. Let me explain this, okay? I wanna tell you what it is. Punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Super strong language, 10. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Here's what God is saying, all right. I, God says, I, I'm jealous for you. I jealously guard you. Come on, mamas in the house. Do you, are you jealous of your kids? 
And so here's what God says. I love you so much, I won't let you get near somebody who's going to hurt you. That's what God's saying. He's jealous. I am, I am, I'm so jealous. And the implication, all right, I'm going to try to be careful with my words. The implication is some predator trying to find your kids to hurt them. Now, mamas are like, mm-mm, sucker, right? No, 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 no. That's what this is talking about. And here's what God says. Now listen, because when you give yourself to them, whatever this God is, to worship and obey them, the God that you worship becomes the God that you serve. And it actually pulls you into bondage, a kind of slavery when you ascribe worship. And then God says this. And so that happens to the third and the fourth generation. That because we'd say, God, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you're true. I don't know if you're there. And then we accidentally misascribe our worship and we end up enslaved to something that we didn't mean to be enslaved to. And then that's passed down. Fear, right? Just stress, worry, that fear. It passes down to the third and the fourth generation. Listen, here's the great news. Listen, but God says, when you come to worship me, I break it all. Come on, I break every bit of that. I break it all. I break it to a thousand generations, to a thousand generations. So God, God isn't saying, and I'm counting generations. God's saying, when you make a decision, I break the curse. And there's not a thousand gods that can keep you from worshiping me. There's not. I, I, I've come for you. I love you. I want you. I desire you. So in India, we found this coin. It's called the Satavana or a Satavahana. Sounds a little bit like a dirty word. Satavahana. <laughs> and it was... <laughs> Glad you guys... Well, that's good. Okay, so it's an inscription of, the, of a coin that represented a king. And so the description that happened in India was a man, he had the coin, he was a king. And here they said, their long explanation, they said, that's the inscription of a human being where there's a scribe like honor and all those things. They said, but they said, the real thing is that there are deities, spirits behind the personalities that are seen internationally. So, and, and that term was one of the first inscriptions in India. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'll, 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 I'll let you pronounce it next time. Sadavahana. Okay, now look at our money. What does it say on our coins? What does it say on our bills? Why is it there? Because it's so easy to make that a God. Did you hear, you hear what I'm saying? It's so, so the founders of our nation knew and they understood. No nation in the history of of the world has been more prosperous than our nation, none. There's not a single one. Babylon, the great Roman empires, the Greek empires, there's not a single nation on the planet that's been more prosperous than us. But what's behind, it's not the, it's not the bill that we're worried about, it's the thing behind the thing that could get us to do this, is to put our knee down to something that's not God. Are you with me? Okay, this is, so, this, so that's, that's the thing that God's after. Like, that's the thing God's after, okay? All right, so I'm gonna end like this. Everybody, everybody in the house and you at the campuses, on every other seat you got one of these, would you just humor me and pull that out for a second? Would you just humor me, all right? If you tithe, that's awesome. We love you. I'm glad you tithe. If you don't tithe, you don't want anything to do with it, that's awesome. We love you. Be done in a second, okay? This is called, hold this up for me, would you? Just, just humor me for a second. All right, good, I see them all. Cross campuses, I see you. Here's what we do at the crossing. The Bible says in Malachi to test me. The entire Bible says, don't, say it with me, don't. don't. Say it again, don't. don't. Say it again, don't. don't. Don't test me, don't test me, don't test me, don't test me. Just trust me at face value. Trust me. Genesis to Revelation. One place in the Bible, 800,000 words in the Bible, one place in Malachi, the Bible says, test me. Say, test me. God says that in regard to the tithe. He says it in regard to the tithe. And we know this is a big deal. We know that it's a challenge. But we're saying together, just fill, fill this out and decide from here. Just decide. I'm going to tithe. Give it 90 days. March, April, and May. And at the end of that time period, listen, if you don't see supernatural results, then we'll just give you back the tithe resource, okay? So this is a no-fail. This, no this is an open book test, you guys. Amen? 
It's an open book, all right? So we do this each year, we do it together, and we help people kickstart a lifestyle of really what it means to and understand. Look, if you start tithing, you'll see life differently. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. Listen, you'll see your marriage differently, amen? amen? You'll see your business differently. You'll see what you drive differently. Every time you get into, listen, I'm seriously getting a witness. Every time you get into whatever it is that you drive that you thought you had to have, that you thought you had to, you know, all the stuff that you thought was so important becomes secondary. And the, the life that you live for God is a life that says, God, look, this stuff is not what I worship. It's what I have, but you have all that I have. Come on, amen. amen. So we're gonna jump in together. I'm gonna encourage you, fill that out. If you don't tithe, fill it out. Look at the details on it, fill it out. Um, make sure that you ACH or check or something because we, it's hard otherwise to give it back to you. And we do this every year. Hundreds of people, listen, come on, hold them up for just a second. Come on, I wanna pray over them. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for the grace that you give us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you can, I, I'm gonna pray for you in a final prayer and then at all of our campuses, the campus pastor is gonna be coming uh, and, and, and so we're gonna lead in, a, in a, an invitation for salvation, all right? Invitation for salvation. Would you join me? Bow your heads with me across campuses. If you're at home somewhere, and let's just say this real, real, not, don't you have to shout, don't shout, but say this, say, Lord Jesus. Come on, say, I give you my life. Tell me, you know I've sinned. Just as, you can, you can whisper that part. And then say this a little bit bigger, I, but I turn it over to you. I give you my life. Help me to trust you. Help me to believe you. Help me to depend on you. Now tell him thank you. Come on, tell him thank you. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. 